Hi, James. Over. So everybody, give it a couple of minutes. Yes. Our attendees to tune in. Okay. Um, we'll begin as we have more attendees tuning in. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Carol Siufi. I'm the market research analyst at Branch Food, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. Um, by way of introduction, Branch Food is a Boston-based innovation hub that connects innovators across the food value chain. Startup founders small and small business owners, corporate leaders and industry experts come to Branch Food for innovation support, curated networking and strategic advice. What differentiates us is our specialized focus within the food industry, upstream and downstream, cross sector and cross borders. We're connected with over 15,000 stakeholders across the value chain and are a nexus where founders from around the globe collaborate with leaders and experts around the future of food. If you're a founder looking for personalized support and strategic advice, please reach out. We'd love to help. And if you're currently fundraising, take a look at our sister company, Branch Venture Group, a network of angel investors that support early stage food ventures. And that was the second most active food investment group in the US in 2021. Visit our website at branchfood.com to learn about our educational events. We have many coming up that cover the topic of retail our monthly community tables, uh, the networking sessions that we've been hosting for the past six years, and our upcoming Food Edge Summit, which is set to take, pl take place in the first week of May, and which will offer multiple opportunities to connect with thought leaders who are creating the future of food. Don't forget to sign up for a monthly newsletter to stay updated on the latest food innovation, news, events, and business support resources. Today, we're thrilled to explore the right stores at the right time and how to crush it in retail. Special thanks to Trax Retail and specifically Dynamic Merchandising for their support with this webinar. Dynamic Merchandising brings retail execution, merchandising, and data to leading and growth brands in brick and mortar retail. Part of Trax Retail, a global company pioneering computer vision in retail, their platform allows customers to understand what is happening on shelf in every store all the time so they can focus on what they do best, delighting shoppers. Before we begin, a couple of notes. The session is recorded and will be shared with you all. The discussion will last around 45 minutes and the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A from the audience. You can submit your questions throughout the session via the Q&A function down below on your screen. With that, I'd like to officially welcome our amazing moderator, Tina Adolfsson, Vice President of Marketing at Trax Retail, along with our awesome panelists, James Bellow, co-founder and CEO at Shameless Pets, and former buyer at Target, John Payne, founder at Frisca, also former buyer at Target, and last but certainly not least, Melvin Hall, co-founder at Global Village Foods. Dina, over to you. Thank you, Carol. It's always a pleasure to be here with Branch Food. Um, John, James, and Mel, we, because we talked uh, two days ago, I know this is going to be an absolutely fantastic ride for everyone that is listening. So to begin with, would you please tell us your origin story? And I'm just going to go to the person to my left, which is James. Yeah. So hey everybody, my name's James Bellow. Um, prior to Shameless Pets, I was actually um, at Target um, doing a multitude of different stints. And the last stint that Target had me do was lead the innovation group and actually had me move out to Boston um, working with MIT and Intel tackling issues in the food system. And, and that's kind of like the impetus behind Shameless Pets is as we started putting different hypotheses on issues in the food system, one of them that kind of got raised was food waste. And we were doing a lot of work with food waste as it related to Target. And then I started doing a lot more research around the waste that was happening both with farmers as well as food processors, not specifically with retail and just realized that there was just this massive issue of food waste that was happening in the U.S. and globally and, and wanted to do something about it and kind of decided that it was time to take a take a leap outside of the kind of corporate culture of Target and, and do something on my own and got lucky enough um, to meet my co-founder who's a product developer and food scientist and you know one thing led to another and we realized there's a real opportunity in the pet world and said you know what how do we how do we tackle food waste and create a healthy pet treat and combine those two together and the rest is history. Absolutely amazing. And feeding and treating our, you know, four-legged friends are, uh, is one of the best part about being part of a bigger family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
John, I've known you for a while. Tell us the origin of Frisca. And before that, you also have a shared expertise in buying. I do. Thanks, Tina. Uh, John Piney, so I'm the founder of Frisca, which is a new supplement brand at CVS, Target, Whole Foods, Amazon, uh, and a bevy of other retailers. I uh, spent 15 years at Target. The last five that I was there, I was leading the healthcare and optical divisions. So I had a team of about 25 people, had a three and a half billion dollar P&L, um, and was one of the foremost experts in consumer healthcare in the U.S. Um, while in that role, I also had a bit of a health scare with pancreatitis that resulted from a gallstone, and uncovered the role of digestive enzymes in our biological breakdown of foods and supplements, and decided to take the leap from Target and create a brand of supplements that focused on products that actually work. Um, I like to say that you can take a multivitamin for 20 years and never have a clue if it's working. So we have a clinically proven probiotic as well as a proprietary blend of digestive enzymes in all of the Frisca formulations to ensure that the efficacy of the product can be felt unlike a number of, of the vitamins that are in the category. Um, and really in looking at the explosive growth of the dietary supplement business really over the last two decades, um, decided we had as good a chance of any to build a brand and, and make a dent in the marketplace, not to take someone else's piece of the pie, but to, to truly make the pie bigger by creating solutions that people can feel working. That's great. And uh, we are focused much more, more on health and wellness these two years than, than I think ever before. Right. And Mel, tell us about your origin story. How did you decide to bring the bold flavors of Africa to the United States? Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you all uh, for inviting me and uh, pleasure to meet John and John. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing so many insights um, from your experiences. Uh, mine was not necessarily from the corporate background. My wife and I met in Kenya on a uh, college uh, uh, foreign studies program. Uh, it was my first introduction to the idea of a much, well, I mean, healthier, I mean, in a organic sort of a way, as in she grew up eating food straight off the farm that her family grew. Uh, she was a chef in culinary uh, uh, training uh, in Kenya, uh, and she really specialized in all natural, really healthy African related cuisine. Long story short, she came back here. We started life together. We had a whole bevy of uh, other plans which uh, were derailed and uh, we ended up just trying our hand at food. Uh, and we started doing small town festivals and things of that nature and it took hold and uh, people really loved the vegetarian options. Uh, or the idea that beans and rice is a perfect protein and it was vegetarian food with flavor. Uh, the idea of cooking with chemicals or processing or additives was just not even within the purview. So even though we didn't look to start some type of trend, uh, the fact was that we began cooking food that had no additives, no preservatives, clean ingredients. And this was well over 30 years ago. Uh, and back then it was new. Uh, so um, we just kind of somewhat, I guess, almost stumbled into the fact that this was a demand area. As we grew, we started a restaurant, uh, catering. we started catering, then restaurant, uh, we found uh, after a while that people had dietary sensitivities. We had a son who was born allergic to dairy, eggs, nuts, and seafood. And as we continue to develop uh, our culinary adventures, uh, we found ways to substitute all the eight major allergens and not lose flavor in the food. And that's the format of what we do. Uh, so essentially, we go to market with uh, ready to eat convenient meals because we know life is busy and people are pressed. Uh, things that you can pull off the shelf and it should come back tasting fresh. Uh, our mantra is we want you to feel like we invited you into our house and made a fresh meal for you. Uh, and that's what we hope you're going to taste in every meal that we make. Uh, every meal is, uh, all of our meal products are free of dairy, eggs, nuts, soy, sesame, seafood, and gluten-free. We make a line of samosas, which are free of everything except the gluten. Obviously, we have gluten in the samosa. Um, and we make them in formats that uh, can be served bulk for food service at a grocery prepared foods department. Um, our primary retail activity is at Whole Foods. So we've got our line of five um, allergy friendly ready to eat meals on the shelf uh, at Whole Foods North Atlantic. Uh, and that's been our testing and proving ground. So uh, 
Uh, we've more recently gotten into a more disciplined metric about watching uh, spins data and really coming up with a strategy for uh, an, a national CPG build out process. And that's being driven by my marketing director who also happens to be my oldest daughter. Uh, and she's driving that whole process of really helping us develop uh, a data driven approach uh, and a matching of our productive capacity with the new facility we just built out uh, so that we can actually grow in that channel. But we're gonna do food service first and then continue to grow the, the, uh, the individual meal, meal process. Um, thank you all. So you all start by you know, defining your product and how the benefits are. Now, how do you go start to define your target consumer? And I'm gonna go back to Mel. You started off with a restaurant. So you were actually talking to your consumer as they were eating it. But mm -hmm. how did you then end up finding that target consumer, identifying them and then finding them at Whole Foods? Well, I have to admit, uh, here is where a leap of faith actually comes through a, a lack of knowledge. Uh, so not being aware that there was a whole process that we should be going through, we just came to the conclusion, well, first of all, we started off um, when we decided to close our restaurant, uh, it was because we'd had our second child and restaurants are fairly difficult for young families. Uh, so we wanted to continue doing what we were doing. And so we realized that prepared meals uh, at our local co-ops was a good outlet. And that's where we first start testing and vetting um, packaged versions of the most popular meals out of the restaurant. Um, and again, using the allergy friendly focus was where we, like you said, you still had a very close to the customer. It was instant feedback. You could put meals out in a week or so and see what sold, what didn't. And you constantly got that feedback about, oh, what's the most popular thing or the best suited for the marketplace that fit within the production capacity that we had. Uh, so we've always been a production first kind of company. We, uh, uh, we are manufacturers uh, who are learning how to be better marketers. Um, and so that closeness to the customer led the process um, and helped us realize that our core customer is not defined by so much of a specific demographic, but really a specific eating style. So we attract people who do want clean tasting food, who want, um, uh, who are a little more on the venture side with flavors, uh, definitely driven by that allergy friendly diet sensitivity, vegan plant based food crowd. So that's how we learned it. And we just took those learnings step by step as we continue to experiment with different stores and eventually into Whole Foods. And, you know, that's where we got enough traction to say, oh, there's a process here. Wonderful. From amazing meals to making sure your belly feels good, I'm going to go to John. John, you had lots of data when you were at Target and you were one of the experts in the field. How did you end up defining your consumer and how did you end up choosing where you were going to find them, like your go-to-market retail? Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost the complete opposite of, of what Mel shared. Of We're looking at millions and millions of data points within the wellness realm of what was working in dietary supplements and, and what wasn't. And there was really this avalanche of understanding of the importance of gut health and overall health. Um, given COVID over the last two years, I think a lot of people have now found out 80% of the immune cells in your body reside in your intestinal tract. And as I said earlier, multivitamins sell over $15 billion a year in the US, but don't do a ton to improve your overall wellness. And our whole thesis was if we can provide a brand and a line of items that can go after and attract that multivitamin user, but provide them with an item that you can feel working, we'd have something there. And that's definitely been borne out in our repeat rates. So in the retailers that we have distribution, our repeat rate is very steadily double the category average uh, as people are finding benefit from the products and continuing to come back into the Frisco line. Sounds great. And James, heading into the treats for dogs, how did you define your consumer, which is the, the pet parent? Yeah, it's almost a cross between John and Mel. Um, you know, I had the target background, but never, never the background within pet. So we had a bet going in as we launched the brand around two kind of key themes within the pet market, humanization of pet, and that more millennial generation, we're going to be owning pets and kind of taking those two 
themes, taking a look at what was working in the human food space and transposing that over into pet. And then really like from a kind of almost the Mel perspective, getting really scrappy using the network that I had to go talk to other brand owners in the human space and get a better understanding of what were the key features and benefits from a sustainability standpoint that their consumers were really reacting positively to. And then going and testing that um, and doing multiple rounds of, of iteration in the beginning. I mean, launching online was a, a key benefit for us because we were able to then change a lot of the messaging in the beginning without having too much of a pushback, um, a la more similar to brick and mortar retail. Um, and really kind of, I would say, continually defining who our consumer has been over the um, four years that we've been in market to now having a pretty good understanding, given that we've kind of grown the brand into the likes of Walmart, Target, Costco, Whole Foods, and then in the pet sector as well, and, and being able to take a look at data and, and talking to our customer um, firsthand. So you mentioned some of the retailers you're in today. Who was the first retail to carry you? Yeah, so we, um, we got lucky, and it's a, a little plug for the branch network. We actually um, launched with HEB through the Food Edge event, it got connected with um, I think a VP at HEB who was there and, and talked to him. We were very early in the process. I think at that point, we essentially had our first packaging design at the time. We were really thoughtful, though, on where we wanted to launch. HEB was, was top of target. We knew that the consumer was who we wanted to go after. And then sp speaking more from a financial perspective, we also knew there was no slotting fees at HEB. And when, when money's coming out of our pocket or my pocket, uh, we wanted to make sure that it was something that we kind of test into and, and didn't have to pay to play, so to say. So um, we got really lucky in the fact that we got connected um, with him and then he was able to get us connected. And, and the story that we told really worked for what HEB was looking for. And, and we kind of knew that through a lot of the conversations that we had with other brands. And, uh, and, and I think you just answered my second question is why were they the right ones for you? Yeah, no, it, it, it was, re it really came down to um, that consumer. HEB is also very well known on, you know, leading the forefront with emerging brands as well. Um, so they were very open to, to launching with us and, and dedicating assets for us as well. So we, we had a lot of marketing assets that HEB put behind us to, to tell the brand story, because for us, you know, there's a, there's a real story behind the brand and it's hard to communicate everything on package. So having a retailer who actually believes in what you stand for and, and wants to communicate on your behalf was, was obviously incredibly important. And then, and then, like I said, really not having to shell out any money, any of my money to, to get on shelf was a really important factor uh, uh, to, to launch with. That is a huge win. And, um, and HEB is actually, uh, aside from being the number one most popular grocery store in the U.S., like they just win on the rankings all the time, is uh, the place to shop if you are in Texas. Um, for anyone who didn't, who was wondering where HEB was. John, how about you? Again, you knew your customer, you knew where to go. Who was the first retailer to carry you and how, how did that launch go? Yes, yeah, so we had a simultaneous launch at Whole Foods and CVS. Um, then I saw one, one participant asked if we used a, a broker to get in. And the answer to that is yes and no. So with CVS, we, um, all of our programs run through the Emerson group. Um, they do our warehousing and sales support. They helped us land the conversation with CVS. I also had a previous relationship with their chief merchant, George Coleman at the time. Uh, he and I were on the NACDS retail advisory board together when I was at Target. So that made it a little bit easier, but I did not use a broker and went straight to the global buying group at Whole Foods um, and was able to get a meeting set up with them by sending them samples um, and leveraging some other connections to, to put in a word. But it was kind of the tale, tale of two different outcomes. Um, CVS gave us nationwide scale. It was a little bit of a risk because we knew it wasn't exactly our customer demo. Um, they're a little bit more of an older demographic where we're focused on millennials and, and younger Gen Xers. Um, and candidly, with everything going on with COVID and foot traffic and all of the marketing and PR plans that we had getting scrapped because everybody was scrambling back in, in April of 2020 of figuring out how to handle COVID, um, we had a lot of really well-laid plans that did not come to fruition. So that was a difficult headwind. 
Um, but with Whole Foods, that was a success story of going in at a time when wellness was more at the forefront in a retailer that's known for launching new brands. Uh, we were given some off-shelf space during resolution season, and that really helped grow our brand in, in that store. They're both great partners. And um, I have to just say, I shop at CVS. So in New England, we all <laughs> shop at CVS. Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> just kind of saying. Um, now, going into Whole Foods again, Mel, talk to us about that Whole Foods frozen aisle and how you got into that knocking on doors. Yeah, well, that was a great experience on our end because, again, it was an extension of what we had been doing. And that's we we felt we had a great product that was apparently resonating with a large number of people with us locally. Uh, so the next question was, well, what will happen when you try to go beyond your immediate, you know, 50 mile radius. Uh, so we had made great inroads by this time in all of the uh, uh, co-ops and natural food stores in Vermont, New Hampshire. Uh, so we felt we had some pretty good momentum going in. We'd set up some distribution. So now uh, getting into Whole Foods is really the question of getting the attention. Now back then, uh, as I, you know, I think I, we talked about this the other day, back in that day, um, the, and this was only what, 2016, 17, but there was a local forager in each store. So you could actually go and if you found the forager and you could convince the forager to bring you into one store that got you into the system and then you could be exposed to all the other stores. So essentially I spent, and, and I kid you not, this was months of stopping in, finding the forager, getting the right name, uh, never end when I was stopping by, leaving samples, leaving sale sheets, coming in, calling back, um, rolling the dice when I was on the road again, just kind of seeing it. And eventually I did establish connections, connection, establish rapport. They tried the product, they, they liked it. Um, and it still took us another, gosh, I can't remember, maybe six months or so before we actually got fully invited to come on shelf. Uh, and at that point, it was in a matter of saying, okay, great. Now we've got uh, presence at Whole Foods. Now we've got to make sure we demo and do supporting work to make sure that we verify that this is something customers get into. And uh, we were very fortunate in that, um, once again, the flavor profile, particularly our strongest drive has always been our vegetarian market, vegetarian and vegan. Uh, because if you ever decide, and periodically my wife and I will say, okay, it's vegetarian week or it's vegan week or what have you. And we're struck with how difficult it is to maintain a really balanced, healthy diet uh, with plant-based solely. Uh, it's more, it's easier now, but every year it gets better. Uh, it was really difficult then. And I think that really helped us see that the place on the shelf in Whole Foods. And we expanded from there. We got one store, uh, Whole Foods Hadley, and we were able to expand that to about 10 stores um, within the following year. And the following summer, I think 2018, 2017, 2018, it's hard to remember. I uh, did the same thing all over again. I just packed up a cooler full of samples, frozen samples, a whole bunch of sales sheets. And I just took a big circle that left from Vermont. Uh, and I would be on the road two, three days at a time. I would just leave Vermont and take a big circle down to Boston and all, over, all the surrounding areas until we built up the store count. And you know, for all the founders that are thinking about doing that, while Whole Foods is now centralized after the Amazon um, acquisition, that is still an approach that works at quite a few different places. I mean, that works at Wake Fern, which is really a co-op um, that works in a lot of different places that are in the, um, you know, the, the healthier parts, the vacation areas where they're like very small co-ops that are like get together for buying. And it still works very well with 7-Eleven where 1,500 are corporate, but another 6,500 are franchisee owned. And each one of those make that decision all by themselves. So going into the secret weapon of having two ex-buyers, former buyers talk to us, um, what are the retailers looking for? James, can you let us know what, what's your perspective? What is a retail buyer is looking for when you walk in through that door? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously each category has their nuances and are a little bit different, but um, from a general swath of, of kind of how I looked at how I looked at it, especially, you know, taking myself out of the buyer's seat and putting myself into an emerging brand, 
founder trying to, to tell my story is really you have essentially three categories that I look at. You know, you have the national brands. So, you know, you, you think for, for my category, you're talking the bag and strips, um, milk bones, that's bringing in traffic for the retail buyer. So that you, you're not going to compete as a new brand with those established national brands. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got your own brands, which are bringing margin to the table. So really for us, it was telling the story around incrementality. And as an emerging brand, bringing that millennial customer to their aisle and, and being able to demonstrate how we're going to be able to do that from the marketing that we're doing out of the store. And then also from the conversion. And John talked a little bit about it around repeat and being able to continue to build your case studies as you as you're able to get that POS data once you're in the retailer to, to be able to be top of mind for that buyer. But for us um, and, and for myself, as we went to continue to build that retail presence, really selling that story around incrementality really hits home for buyers. And, and that's what they're looking for. They, they really don't want another emerging brand to come in and just trade sales with some other brand. They want to they wanna grow the pie. And that's really where you're able to, to kind of position your brand. And if you can do that and, and you can convince them of that, and then your numbers on the back end, once you're on shelf, are able to demonstrate that, it's a real, it, it starts to become a pretty easy story um, as you keep talking to other buyers. I agree. John, do you have anything else to add? What else was learned at Target? Yeah, I mean, not just Target, but incrementality is key everywhere. And when we went in, I'll, I'll use the CVS example specifically, understanding what their objectives are. Uh, they were clearly looking to try to find a stable of brands that appealed to a younger customer um, and always growing the incremental sales. So when we went in, we said, we will bring in new shoppers to the category. Um, and we do think that this messaging resonates with a younger consumer. And after six months of data, we pulled the numbers and we could show them that 91% of the purchases that were made of Frisca had never been purchased. Those consumers had never purchased digestive health at CVS before. So the incrementality was clearly there. And from a demo standpoint, the average Frisca shopper at CVS is 11 years younger than the average digestive health shopper at CVS. So being able to show them our hypothesis and why we thought it would work and then come back six months after launch and prove that, yes, it, it did both of those things, albeit neither of them in the volume that we wanted it to, um, certainly was a feather in our cap of proving out that incrementality. So saying incrementality is one thing, proving that you can do it is another, but that really is the, the underpinning of success is incremental profitable sales. Now you mentioned the word that always makes me excited, which is data. So what, how do you find the data? Where are you buying it from? Where are you um, getting it for free from retailers? How are you working with retailers on data? I can start on that one. So CVS, uh, as I said, we go through the Emerson Group. Emerson purchases the extra care platform. So if you are not utilizing that and have access to it, you are asleep at the wheel uh, because we kind of eat, sleep, breathe that to understand the different trends, both regionally, between our products, between our products and the category, and just understanding how our basket data is different than competitors. And while we have not been hitting the top line metrics that we had hoped to achieve, nowhere close actually, um, we have been hitting some really strong underpinnings of incremental growth, younger shoppers, and that repeat rate has been very strong that, that has allowed us to stay on shelf despite the softer than expected top line. The famous words of COVID era, you are on mute. I was uh, trying to be polite while my mom was answering the phone. Um, <laughs> that was my phone call. Um, so can, one of the questions that we have in the, in the chat and uh, one of the questions that we had in our flow was, once you get in and you obviously all went into very ideal retailers for your product and your categories, how do you support them at retail? How do you support your own product and brand at retail? And how do you support the retailers in what they want your category to do? John, go ahead and go first. I will go first and then uh, I'll leave it in, in a layup for Mel. Um, <laughs> so it really is retailer specific and understanding what each retailer wants. 
Uh, the most obvious one that we have, sorry, this motion light keeps going off. The, the one that we have uh, most clear and present right now is the Roundel program with Target. So they have a very well-oiled digital media marketing team called Roundel that if we can use their marketing tools to connect the bullseye with our brand, it can really make one plus one equal three. Um, it is a very staunch goal of the merchant team there to improve their roundel performance and have, have brands investing in those marketing tools. Uh, with CVS, it was really about their extra care platform and utilizing extra bucks promotions. Um, and it's a little bit more difficult in our arena at Whole Foods, but we have seen demos be very effective, although they're limited in their use because of our, our classification as a supplement. We were able to get a couple programs and, and they performed very well. And I think Mel could, could echo that sentiment with his, his line of products. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, Whole Foods demos do tend to drive a lot of product and does very well. Obviously, that's completely changed in the post-COVID era. We had the before times, but now this is afterwards. Uh, so we have yet to re restart a demo program uh, but we do maintain through our distributors a regular promotional uh, calendar. So we will look at all of the meals and just make sure that we keep at least two of the five SKUs on a 10% or 15% um, uh, discount uh, during the course of the year. Uh, and we try to target that within the seasonality that we know is built into the calendar. There are certain times people are more interested in certain types of food and we kind of try to guess that as best we can. Uh, we are um, working my, again, my director of marketing is really working on pulling that Whole Foods data from their portal uh, and making correlations between, you know, what's moving, related to promotions, related to seasons, related to targeted social media advertising, which is uh, another avenue that we're on now. So on our end, we're really testing, if you will, we're testing and norming the processes that obviously John and James have, you know, really dialed in. You guys have some great, you know, uh, uh, strategies and things already built in. So we're testing and norming that because on our end, we're starting as manufacturers, we're building out the food service to maintain the business growth, uh, but it's like we're studying that larger expansion. We are in Earth Fair Markets as well, if I didn't mention that. They brought us in on their food service side, uh, but the food service items we sell to them are retail bag. So they've got, uh, we've got this great falafel product uh, that's an allergy friendly falafel with a sunflower seed tahini sauce to it, as well as a vegan kofta. If anyone knows what kofta is, it's a black eyed bean. Well, actually, sorry. Traditional kofta is a meatball, uh, Egyptian meatball with either beef or lamb. Our version is a black eyed bean vegan uh, kofta with a spiced eggplant sauce. So we've got all of those items in retail. And so they're selling from the grab and go case, but still with the UPC and a retail trail to them. So we're looking at how do we track that data because we're gonna position both that retail pack for food service as well as the grocery uh, pack. And so we're, we're really learning how to keep track of that and uh, continue to drive promotions directly through the distributor, distributor discounts and other things like that, as well as uh, social media. And the, um, the one other thing I would add, because I, I echo very similar what John and Mel had to say, but in the beginning, um, it's tough, right? Like if you haven't raised funding, it's really hard. It's really expensive. Um, getting back to what does a buyer want and building relationship with a buyer, if you can talk about incrementality, you can talk about how you're bringing that new customer and you can start making asks as well as, you know, secondary placement for us at HEB, we got put on primo picks, we got put into their marketing campaigns, marketing flyers all for free, because again, it was elevating the buyer internally as well. Um, so the buyer was able to then politically inside of those four walls, be able to talk about how they're supporting sustainability, supporting upcycling. And they're able to then give you as a brand owner, essentially free assets, because in the beginning, we ran, we knew we needed to support at retail from a TPC standpoint. We knew we needed to do some more kind of social acquisition, but frankly, we didn't have the funds for it. Um, so we were, we, we launched a little bit soft because of that, but 
being able to kind of hold true to what that story was and let the data prove that out. We were able to then go back and that's how we were able to continue to build. And then at, through fundraising and whatnot, we're able to then go kind of support the brand in, in retail the way that we knew we needed to. But, you know, I think there's always a theory on where you want to go. And then there's a practice in the beginning of what you need to do to, to actually prove yourself because those first couple months are the most important couple months to, to stay on the shelf if you're in a larger retailer because after a few months they're they're up talking about line review and and looking um looking at what next year has to say and if, if you don't have that relationship and you don't you haven't proven yourself um you know you don't have much time you might be off of the shelf that next year so uh james one of the things that we talked about the other day was understanding that line review process and you know what's the right time to talk to the buyers so on the one side, it's when you're trying to get in. On the other side is as you are in there and uh, you're starting to compete and you might've started the race a little bit later. Uh, tell us more about line review process and kind of like what are those first three questions that people need to just know or have asked so that they're not wasting their time? Yeah, yeah. It's something that I, I definitely realize I, I take for granted coming from Target as I've connected with other founders who, who don't come from retail or haven't pitched retail, but you know, the vast majority of the retailers that we're talking about here are online reviews, meaning that they're planning their assortment anywhere from six to 12 months before it actually goes live. So even if you go to Target and you're able to secure a meeting with the buyer after you know, months of agony trying to get that meeting, the buyer can very quickly come to you and say, I absolutely love Shameless Pets. I love what you stand for but we just had our line review and planned out 2023's assortment. So I can't do anything because my hands are tied. Come back to me in eight months and we'll talk about 2024. And point in case, like that happened directly with me with Whole Foods. Um, so we lost over, I think it was 20 months um, that we just couldn't get on the shelf uh, because of that line review. So I think the number one thing to not waste time for these retailers is figuring out when that line review is for your category. Um, you know, that could be via brokers, via founder network, um, but, but ask that question. It never hurts to connect with the buyer, but really connecting with a buyer leading into a line review when that buyer can actually make a decision is really important. And then to your, to that follow-up question that you asked is once you're on, don't take it as a given that you're going to be on for years to come. So because they're planning nine months out from the set, you have those three months to prove yourself. And then you're leading up to that next line review. So really getting on driving your business and then also having that strategy in play on how are you connecting with the buyer and how are you staying relevant and top of mind for that buyer, knowing that that next year's line review is right around the corner is, is really important. All right. Now, another part of supporting retail is actually looking fantastic on shelf and that can be anything that can be your packaging stands out the shelf tray looks amazing or you have an end cap and i know that that is john's tee up for talk to us about why you pick the packaging of frisca um the color schemes i mean it's bold it's different it stands out tell us about your choices yeah, I mean, through the experience that I had at 15 years of Target, it was pretty easy to see that distinctive products do well with consumers. And I like to say that the iPhone would not be the iPhone if not for great design. If it looked like a BlackBerry, it probably would not have taken off the same way. Uh, so that innovative technology and innovative appearance, right? Like this pretty sleek, it's, it's nice to have and, and that made it differentiated. So when we looked at our packaging, we said, what can we do to stand out? Um, Quickly decided on a cobalt blue glass bottle for the inside of our products because it has premium nature and it has the best stability over plastics. Um, and then for the outer tube, it was really trying to make a bold swing to stand out and be noticed by consumers at shelf. Um, so we went with a premium paperboard. As you can see, you know, this is not the cheapest packaging that's out there, but it is certainly distinctive at shelf and it's, it's resonated with consumers. That is one of the most consistent points of feedback that we get in comments and reviews is that I love the packaging. Um, and as they say, that's the final 10 seconds of, of advertising is your packaging. So being clear, talking about condition specific benefits, that's how we name all of our products. We don't say collagen with melatonin, chamomile and lavender. 
we talk about radiant rest of duty sleep and trying to, to make sure that that is a through line with all of our external social communications as well. Um, making it simple and standing out from the rest of the crowd is important. Uh, to the other point on display, anytime you can get display, it is a huge asset for the brand because it further ties your brand image with the retailer that they saw it. Um, when I was at Target, we had tons and tons and tons of in-store surveys. And on average, the average guest that walks through Target is exposed to over 1,000 different signs. So how do you have a sign in a package that really stands out and differentiates your product um, and, and make a message that will, will be salient? So I, I also have this that is coming out in a couple months. We're talking about enzyme-powered vitamins. This will be on shelf next to our packages. Um, it's certainly an expense, but it's one that we feel is worth making because if you think about enzyme powered vitamins, the consumer might not know what enzymes are, but if they see that Frisca has enzyme powered, there's a high likelihood that they will perceive that to have more value than your average vitamin, which it certainly does. Absolutely. Sometimes saying, rec recognizing that your consumer might not be the most informed on their category, but, um, but knows what benefit they want, right? Knows what they're trying to avoid. Um, and that's also true in allergy free. Now, that young preemie that changed your early plans, Mel, turned out to be the one that designed your packaging and your packaging is gorgeous. Tell Thank us you. about why, you know, how, well, how she did it and, um, and what she's really putting forth when you're making your choices on food. Absolutely. Well, we already had, you know, as John alluded to, you really want to be clear about what it is you're offering to the customer that appeals to that customer. So they're going to look and say, oh, what about this makes me worth stopping that millisecond <laughs> to look at this again? Uh, so we had our features, benefits, uh, all the attributes uh, already in. Uh, but I will uh, somewhat um, abashedly admit, I did the first round of design work, uh, working with some people to kind of help, but I guided that process. And my daughter, you know, having a millennial sensibility, um, having worked at South by Southwest and Beats by Dre, she came in and she looked at the package and said, no, this will not do. <laughs> so she uh, found, first of all, I have to commend her. She first did a great job of establishing network. So if anyone is out there looking at how do I move forward, uh, really finding those networks like Branch Foods and others who are, who are solving the same problems you're tackling, that's a great starting point because you need uh, you need eyes that are as close to it as you are. You know, often they say you're too close. You, you can't see the forest for the trees. We couldn't see the tree for the bark. Uh, so, you know, having her come in and realize that if you can change that packaging and really grab that customer right at the shelf level, that's where all the difference is made. And our sales have actually reflected that. So she did it. She found a great designer. Uh, she laid out specific brand properties and brand aesthetics fonts. Uh, she laid out all the concepts that she wanted to see as consistent across the brand and then got a great designer who was able to communicate that into the packaging. And we had a wonderful back and forth, my wife and I, my daughter, the designer, uh, several others, uh, until after much pain and uh, process, we landed on that packaging. So that was a real uh, boon for us and a great experience. Um, and it has really yielded dividends. Wonderful. And James, I know you've had a few different variations of packaging. Uh, talk to us about that process, but also mention some of the names of your flavors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's very similar to what John talked about, right? At, at the end of the day, we knew the pet category is, is highly emotional. Um, you've got to win over that emotion. Um, and also from a humanization standpoint, you also have to appeal to the pet owner, right? So the pet owner has to feel that that is a good tasting treat for their dog. Um, obviously, well, we, we do have some customers who try the treats, but the vast majority don't, but, but want to want to have that sense of feeling that they're giving their dog the best. Um, but what we wanted to do is, so, you know, rooted 
in our company is mission based around upcycling around sustainability, but we didn't want to come off as that kind of preaching from the soapbox greenwash type brand that we're saving the world. So really in talking to our customers and really understanding the fun and emotional aspect of it, we really started to work on combining really unique flavors that are out there, some regional. So, you know, the, the brand essentially started out in Boston. So we launched a lobster flavor and we called it lobster rollover. So what that really does is start to engage the customer. We get, you know, a lot of um, you know, social posts showing their dog rolling over, engaging with the product, having a lobster roll with that. And it just brings, it brings the pet owner and the pet more together from an emotional standpoint and has fun. And then we bring them into the upcycling nature of the brand and, and the mission. And that's really where we then drive the loyalty and the repeat comes from that. But we wanna make sure that we're hitting you know, first and foremost, what that pet owner is looking for. And, and through that process, like I was telling you, I, I mean, we, we iterated packaging. Uh, I can't tell you um, how many times I cursed myself out for going with Flexo because we should have done a digital print um, because I was gun ho that that was the right, you know, bag design. And then two months later, we had 50,000 bags and plates that we had to toss. So, um, but really, you know, continuing to edit um, and kind of stay stay in market for what your consumer is looking for. Sounds great. Now in the questions, we're um, being pushed to answer a bit more about slotting fees. Is slotting fees fair game? And so I'll say it. Uh, so retailers make their numbers and slotting fees is included in that for a lot of the groceries, for a lot of other retailers as well. Um, and a bootstrapped entrepreneur usually tries to find those places where the big slotting fees are not needed. Um, and it also makes you choose your assortment and kind of go out there with how many SKUs are the right ones. So without bashing anybody, but what are the retailers that maybe are a little bit more friendly? Um, and, and at what point is the slotting fee actually worthwhile? And how do you approach it? You've, you've seen it from multiple places. Um, I'll let John and James go first. Uh, John, do you want to tackle this one? Yeah, I mean, we, first off, being on the buyer side, everything is always a negotiation. There's never a rule that can't be broken. And if you ask, and, and if you're steadfast on not being able to pay fees, which we put that out as a mandate, um, there are other ways to try to get around that. So we have had retailers reach out to us and say they want to bring us in. Um, and if there's a fee associated, we have politely declined. And th that is all about growing sustainably and not growing at all costs. It's things that you can offer up. We had a channel exclusivity with a certain retailer that helped us get around some of the fees. Um, with another retailer that we're working with, we waived all fees, but did guarantee that we could hit a ongoing margin rate um, you can't take rate to the bank. You can take dollars. So agreeing to that rate also gives them to have skin in the game because they want your sales to grow. Um, so I'd say be open to the conversations, understand all of the levers that are out there that you can ask around because it isn't always slotting for your bust, even though they may say that it is. And if you have reps, your reps will definitely say that it is because they have to have that conversation 35 times over and they don't want to have it. So take your reps to the mat too. Of, of trying to go after slotting fees and make sure that you're getting the appropriate value for those fees. James, do you have anything to add? I, I, I love John's last comment on the reps because I know there was another question around, you know, do you have a rep group or not? That has been one of my largest frustrations with, with reps is knowing what we know on the other side, to John's point, you know, having, having reps tell you, I'm not even gonna go talk to this retailer. If you say no, everything's a negotiation. So make sure that you're pushing back there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think John, I think John nailed it just to, to kind of answer your question more directly. Um, you know, we focused on HEB, we focused on Meyer Wegmans, um, very well-known retailers who do not charge slotting fees. Um, and that was a, a focus for us because we were bootstrapped and we knew we didn't have to dance around that conversation. And then similar to John, we had, you know, polite, politely said no, um, maybe not as politely as John, but, uh, you know, and sometimes when you say no, 
if buyers really want you and you really feel a need for their assortment, that that's the beginning of the conversation and the negotiation. So, and, and sometimes it isn't. Just, so. And Mel, have you had any of those conversations as well? We've had a lot of conversations with potential advisors about directing towards stores with sliding fees. And I think we've taken a philosophical position that is pretty much what uh, James and John have already laid out as their tactical uh, disposition. And I love what you guys are saying. And I really appreciate it because we are looking at it as a, we are more going to study how we're going to expand it. And we're going to do exactly what you both said. We're going to be looking at where are the stores where that's not an issue. Uh, I think we run at it from a different direction. We've got some great distribution partners coming on board right now and some great opportunities. So we're looking at how do we um, work with our distributors to establish the relationships with the right retailers so that that whole process is shortcut. We may end up needing a broker at some point right now because of the fact that I'm in the habit of maintaining relationship building from customer to the shelf. And I, it, it, I, I've often been told I am a control freak and I am a recovering control freak and I will admit it and own it. Uh, so uh, whether I'm gonna be looking to have a broker or representative at some point, I may be convinced of it, uh, but um, be assured I follow, as John said, the process of saying everything is a negotiation and I wanna keep clear informational tabs on how the conversations are going and, you know, absolutely just knowing that we can veto that next step or whatever needs to happen so that we can go on the way that we think is advantageous for our brand. I think the big thing is you can't just say no, but you can say no and here's why, because we can do one, two, three things that others maybe can't do for you. Exactly. And yeah, I think the other great thing, point. just a peek behind the buyer's desk. I mean, there are plenty of times where you might overcharge a larger national brand to go get your dollars letting an emerging brand come in to John's point if they're willing to sign up for X, Y, Z. And again, you also have to think about it politically for that buyer, like I talked about it earlier, but that buyer is also looking to get promoted themselves, right? They yeah. wanna to continue to work on up. So if you can help them to sell their internal story up the chain and you can fit in on that, if you understand what they're standing for, there are ways to get around those numbers easy ways to get around those numbers. Um, and it's just, you know, asking the questions and figuring out what's important to them. Well, let me also offer this insight. Um, you know, one thing that we have as an advantage on our end is that because we are the manufacturers as well as the uh, marketing side, uh, we do have the ability to, you know, say, hey, you know, back to John's point, yeah, maybe we can't do sliding fees per se, but, you know, we can do a little extra on free fills and, you know, uh, some case count uh, work to make sure that we're giving you enough lead of product because on our end, I can control the margins on the product side. Uh, we're making our own product so I can see exactly what those numbers look like and use that to leverage the retail relationship. Um, so that's kind of somewhat our approach as well. Thank you. And um, the question that kind of also goes in with the distributors and, and your perspective on also from a recovering control freak, you know, working <laughs> with others, um, the landscape has changed. I mean, the last two years have made everyone uh, rethink their supply chains, their where they go shopping, um, how, how consumers consume, where do they find it from, online shopping went, um, you know, quadrupled, quintupled even. So the question is, do you think distribution and retail in general has been learning a new way to tap dance? So are they changing their behaviors? Are they changing their negotiations? Are the rules becoming suggestions? Are they reaching out for new ideas? And thank you, Alex, for the tap dance question. I think absolutely. And it starts and stops with digital. Um, the digital first nature of retail is only going to accelerate. It's not going to go away. We talked a lot about packaging. However much time you spent on designing your packaging brand and brand guidelines, 
spend 10 X that amount in your product detail copy and digital presence, because that is nine times out of 10 where people are first going to interact with your brand. So spend the time on your website, spend the time on your product detail pages to really understand what the consumer is being exposed to when they see your brand. Um, that has changed. Absolutely. And, and I would just echo to, to John's point, even two and a half years ago, retailers that we were having conversations with who kind of um, really put, put their online presence in the shadow, it's point number one in the, in the conversation. And they're looking for brands who can shine online. You know, brands, most emerging brands have a story to tell, being able to tell that story concisely. Um, it's only a benefit for us because you do have that more space to be able to tell that and show up and then being able to position that. So I think um, it has been interesting to see how fast buyers have changed to, to looking for that and having those conversations. Yeah. Well, I think on our end, because our product is frozen, um, the digital channel, and we did do a pivot strategy where we shipped direct to customer for a time, but the uh, economics on uh, shipping frozen just really don't work in our favor. Um, but what we are finding is that uh, there is a tremendous amount of food service demand for us first that does some retail spillover. Uh, and we're expecting that that also is going to lead into frozen grocery because frozen grocery uh, had a renaissance and a revival during COVID because people started going back to the frozen shelf. And we feel like even though our signature DNA comes out of food service, we present a meal in frozen grocery that has a pack size and a presentation that is somewhat prepared meals. And so we're finding that that's really playing well and getting more traction. And we're looking to really do more research to um, develop that direction over time. And that is to say, okay, we know frozen groceries where we are. We know that's a, a harder logistical channel to balance. Uh, how do we really maximize the advantage that we offer to the retailer uh, to have our, our product be a lead product in that process uh, as consumers are looking for better uh, better meals and better products in the frozen grocery section. And we're almost at the end. So I'm going to ask you all to give like that one last piece of advice or suggestion, whether it is about the startup journey or whether it is about the retail. And then I'm going to ask Carol to come and once again, let us know about Food Edge because there's been a few Food Edge questions uh, in the chats. Um, James, do you want to start? Um, yeah, sure. I I'd say, you know, go where your consumers are. Don't chase doors, um, really understand and develop your point of view. Um, make sure that as you get in, your velocity numbers are there to continue to grow. It's really easy to, to either pay for distribution or, or kind of be able to, to tell everybody you are in thousands and thousands of doors when those doors might not be productive. So really, really be cognizant of who your consumer is and, and make sure that you're showing up where they shop. Thank you, Melvin. Yeah, I think uh, for our side, um, if I would encourage anyone, I would say you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to run into things you don't know. Um, don't be afraid of making the mistakes, but limit the impact of those by experimenting. Um, well, at least, and I'm going to speak from my side of things. Uh, we've experimented with small footprints and found a model that works and then stepped into a larger setting. So we've been able to mitigate the cost of, uh, of that learning curve. And so, you know, at the end of the day, nothing is certain in business. Um, uh, and I think the one thing I would leave people is take an action, get a response, take another action, iterate another response, because that's how business works of all kinds. You just got to keep taking actions and uh, acting on the response. Thank you. And John? Uh, I would close with, it is really hard, really, really hard founding a brand and getting the traction that you want. Um, stay resolute in your convictions. And for me, it was all about finding things that I could get personal gain from outside of work. Because um, people always say when you have your own thing, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Um, I can firmly agree with the fact that the lows are lower <laughs> and, and having those outlets, whether it be family, whether it be exercise, whether it be something else, maintaining that healthier balance. If you can stay healthy outside of the office in your business, which becomes 24 um, seven, it's only going to improve the results that you have. So stay strong in your convictions and 
focus on things that give you benefit and joy outside of, of the business as well. Thank you. And if I can offer a piece of advice, um, definitely reach out to all the people that can help you. And that is the network, such as Branch Food. There's others. We often partner with Food Bevy as well, and as does Branch Food. Um, some of the conferences are very much on education instead of just a trade show. So look for those. And there are partners, there are, you know, merchandisers and brokers and distributors that will be your partner and work with you. And, uh, and there are founders that are going to share their advice. So look for the helpers. Carol, back to you. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, James and John and Melvin for the very um, exclusive insights. Uh, when Tina and I connected about um, or discussed the possibility to host this session, we were wondering um, how, would read, how would a former buyer, category buyer or merchandiser launch their product in the US? And I guess we have an answer to our question. Um, thank you all for tuning in and for the exclusive insights um, shared by the panelists. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, I know the session was very informative and to all the founders out there in the, in the audience, do leverage your community. It takes a village. Innovation is a collaborative undertaking. And if French Food or Tina or um, uh, Dynamic Merchandising or any of the founders here can help, please reach out. Uh, we would love to support you. Um, I know that John needs to uh, drop off, but for, yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning in again. For those of you who are interested to learn more about Food Edge uh, and ways to forge thank strategic you. connections with uh, leaders in the industry, um, Food Edge. Thank you, James. Uh, for Thanks, everyone. Um, Food Edge is set to take place in the first week of May. Uh, it will be a virtual summit, and we are. Um, putting together some in-person um, elements to bring together the community of innovators and provide you with those, um, I guess, engaging networking experiences. Uh, join the mailing list. Uh, we'll be announcing some updates soon. Um, so I'll make sure to include it in the follow-up email that you all receive, including the recording of the session. Um, and we hope to see you at Food Edge uh, in May of 2022 where we'll highlight some of the challenges, opportunities, and innovations that are taking place across the value chain. And consumer product innovation is definitely a topic that's gonna to be top of mind. Um, I do wanna uh, remind you all that there are two additional sessions as part of the Retail Success Series that we're hosting. Um, the next one is on uh, February 17th at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Zoom, and it will cover uh, the best retail practices for CPG founders planning national expansion. Um, and then on February 24th, we will be covering um, how functional beverage brands can navigate uh, retail success. 4 p.m. Eastern time, you will need to register to get the link, the link to join, and all the sessions will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. And if you're interested, we're hosting a session next week on demystifying trade spend, which we touched upon today in the conversation. Uh, it's on Wednesday, uh, February 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we hope to see you then. Um, if you have any questions or would like to engage with us, with me, with Tina, if, you, if we can help you in any way, please reach, reach us out. Um, info at branchfood.com is the best email to connect. Um, and I guess stay safe, everyone. Have a good one. And Melvin, thanks again for- Thank you all. Tina, thank this you has been great. The awesome uh, moderation and for the awesome- Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you.